Hmm? Hello, everyone. Uh, it's our great pleasure to welcome Professor Peter Wonka from COS giving a talk in our 3D GV seminar series this week. So Peter uh, is a pioneer in urban modeling. He has done a lot of great works in this area, and he has done a lot of great works in other areas uh, in computer graphics, computer vision, and optimization, okay? Uh, so Peter has won many awards, um, and uh, let's welcome Peter. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, what I'm going to... Peter, uh, it's, uh... go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I hear some voice. Yeah, now it's fine. All right. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a bit of a history and uh, overview of uh, urban modeling. Before that, uh, I would like to do some advertisement uh, and uh, self-promotion, unfortunately has to be part of every talk. Uh, so I'm working at KAUST, which is a graduate only university near Jeddah on the west coast of Saudi Arabia. And on the bottom, you see an image of the campus. Specifically, you see an image of the research buildings and you see an image of the library. So this uh, here, around here somewhere, is uh, my office. All right, sorry, is this correct? Um, <clears throat> there are many opportunities and we are hiring basically on all levels. We're looking for MS, PhD students, interns, visiting scholars, postdocs, research scientists, and faculty. I'm part of the Visual Computing Center, which is a research center focused on computer vision, computer graphics, visualization, and a bit of machine learning. And we have nine faculty in these areas and about 150 people total. So um, we would like to be able to compete with the best other universities in the world in the area of visual computing and using a popular website, CS rankings, uh, again, not to overemphasize the importance of rankings, but looking at the areas where we try to compete in compute the vision, compute the graphics and visualization, uh, you will see that our center is one of the biggest, largest research institutions in these areas. To introduce myself, um, now this is, my past life, basically research until maybe it's hard to put an exact date on it, but let's say research until 2018. Um, I would say that mainly what I did was design computation and for design computation, I was focusing on two sub problems. The first sub problem is creating new designs and I was focusing on applications in graphics, visualization, urban planning, and architecture. And to a slightly lesser degrees, maybe reconstructing existing designs, layouts also for urban, uh, applications in urban reconstruction, remote sensing. So a lot of my interest was in reconstructing urban environments and modeling urban environments. And the use techniques were optimization, what I call basically traditional machine learning, user interaction, and uh, procedural modeling. So for example, in 2018, there were like three papers at SIGGRAPH, which was up until that time, the major venue for 
I would say, publications in this area. So uh, there was a paper about material modeling, material synthesis. Um, we had a paper about hybrid triangle and quad mesh design, um, which you see, this is the outer skin of this building that consists of triangular and uh, quad panels. And uh, you know, we had a paper that was a collaboration with another faculty, Wolfgang Heidrich, who was kind of lead of the project to do reconstruction of time varying 3D data uh, from uh, an ICT device that is from uh, tomography images. And you can see here is the reconstruction of a rose data set that is a rose that's welting. And uh, another example here is a data set of rising dough. Again, it's a tomographic 3D reconstruction over time. Um, probably, you know, research changed uh, since that time quite a bit. And uh, if you look at just some random recent papers uh, from our group, you will see there is a strong shift more to a mixture of machine learning graphics and vision venues. So similar to many other graphics groups, uh, people in my group now publish a lot more in CVPR, ICCV, and some in maybe try to at least start more on ICLR, NeurIPS, in addition to SIGGRAPH, SIGGRAPH Asia as the main venues. So for example, a paper on depth estimation from CVPR this year, um, still trying to have some presence in SIGGRAPH, SIGGRAPH Asia, a paper about hairstyle transfer uh, using generative adversarial networks. And um, so what you see in these images is an input photograph maybe given on the top left, and then hairstyles from other photographs are being transferred onto the person. And what you would like to have is that the person stays the same, but the hairstyle changes. Or uh, the recently NeurIPS 2021 uh, uh, paper about sketch graph, sketch generation, uh, for CAD models. Um, and so most of the methodology, so I would say everybody in the group besides one person now works on machine learning and deep learning and tries to address similar problems, generating new content and reconstructing content, but somehow the, the methodology probably changed quite a lot. So we will go back to uh, this more current research, but we'll start uh, with uh, you know, history uh, way back. Um, first question is what, uh, if we talk about urban modeling, what elements are we interested in modeling? And there's a long list of possible elements that people in my group and also in other groups have tackled. Um, we'll also emphasize examples, just examples from earlier papers. So from SIGGRAPH 2001, the original city engine paper uh, had a lot of content about street graph generation. And for street graphs, it's, it's like a graph generation problem, graph synthesis problem, which is nice because it's, it's like a unique type of problem. It's 2D, it's a graph, but at the same time, it has a spatial embedding component to it. Then for buildings, I would generally distinguish between the mass models. So modeling building mass models I, is modeling of the rough volumetric structure of a building. For example, the structure of this skyscraper here. And 
uh, you could also have facade modeling, which fills in the details on the surface of a building. Um, people looked at parcel layouts and parcel layouts is basically the pattern of the individual pieces of property in a city. For example, this uh, paper from Eurographics 2012 that uh, tries to model parcels. Floor plans uh, is another topic that uh, multiple people looked at. And with for, for floor plans, we talk about mainly having the boundaries of the rooms, the doors, and uh, labels for the rooms. What type of room is it? Is it a living room, kitchen, or a garage? Roofs. Um, should be largely self-explanatory. The roof structures can be very simple, flat roofs on some modern, maybe office buildings, to fairly intricate roofs on uh, residential single family housing. Some people looked at the distribution of vegetation. I'm not gonna talk about modeling individual plants, which is another very large area of research. But the interface kind of to urban modeling is just modeling the distribution of individual trees inside the city and or the distribution of individual plants inside a city. Furniture layout is uh, also something that is quite popular for multiple reasons. And that consists of placing the furniture, orienting it and selecting pieces of furniture from a library to uh, fill up a room. Here's one of the earlier SIGGRAPH papers about the topic from 2010. Um, I tried for a very long time to find a good abstraction of uh, explaining the problem. And uh, this is just one try. I had to, there's some trade-offs on how, how exactly to realize it, but um, I'm gonna try it with uh, this slide. So what we're talking about in procedural modeling and a lot of the modeling that has been subject of uh, research, we're not talking about generating a single building with software such as AutoCAD, but we're talking about generating multiple buildings or generating large areas uh, automatically or semi-automatically. And for explaining the problem a bit, I'm, I look at this, I, I mean, create this somewhat abstract representation of the design space of possible solutions. Let's just think about the design space of facades only here. And what we see is on the left side, an example of a high quality design Maybe not because the architecture is so great, but because it's a plausible, really existing building that looks like this. So this is a facade that exists. Uh, so we would judge this as high quality. And then on the top right, there is a design that is almost pure nonsense. I mean, it has some random materials in, in some fairly random order. Maybe something looks a bit like a window, but uh, this type of design, we would say the quality is, uh, is very bad. And if we are looking at this abstract representation of design space, then we have these two axes. The one axis on the bottom, we could say is the quality axis. And um, so I kind of made some arbitrary subdivision of design space that 
has some high quality, some medium, some bad, and some very bad quality designs. And this visualization should just show the problem that if you just randomly generate something, the space of, or the, the, the number of samples in this space that are actually very bad designs is disproportionately much, much larger than uh, the high quality designs. And on the other axis, it just means like how many of these designs are there? And you could think about this as variability and, and making the link to uh, machine learning uh, terminology, then variability is most closely associated with recall. If you have a modeling method, you would say how many of the existing good designs can we generate? What, what is our variability? What is our recall? Uh, yikes. I made some error here that should be precision. And um, the, on the quality axis, it's more about precision. Like what's the quality of the designs that, that we can generate? Unfortunately, this error will show up on uh, all the slides. All right. So if we are looking for a solution, what we would like to have is we would like to have a solution that uh, gives us like all the high quality designs, but it doesn't create any of the bad or medium or very bad quality designs. Going back in history, because I'm so old, I uh, actually had to use a library for my research. And uh, you know, many years ago, and a lot of these fundamental papers, uh, they didn't exist online. So uh, I do have like a really large collection of old papers copied from a library, a lot of the papers appeared in this journal, Journal of Environment and Planning B. This is where a lot of the traditional shape grammar literature comes from. And the pioneer, the really important name in this context is George Steiny. And he had this like really, really fascinating uh, idea that really influenced a lot of other people in their work uh, about shape grammars. So here's an example from a paper copied about creating these Palladian villas and uh, these Palladian villas going back to the previous slide, they look something like this, or, or this is a floor plan. And so what he did is created grammars for creating the floor plans of these villas. And I would like to explain the main ideas here because it's a very fundamental concept and it's just so influential. What we have is we have rules that define derivations. And what you see here in the first rule is a, uh, L shape, an L shape. And this L shape by the rule gets translated. This red cross here is just to give a reference coordinate system. And then we have another rule that is a rectangle that gets translated. So two simple translation rules. Looks like very, very simple. And then, we have a starting shape. These are these two L shapes. And now we can discuss about what type of rule matching we allow. So let's say we allow scaling and translation and uh, rotation. So whenever we can match a scale rotated or translated version of any of these uh, left side shapes, for example, the L shape or the rectangle, then we can apply the rule. So uh, then there are two derivations that are possible. From this starting shape, what we will do is we will take 
one of the L's and we will uh, translate it. And then you go from this shape here to this shape here. And now we can pick another rule, the second rule to select this rectangle square in the middle and translate it up. So we get to here and then we can I think apply another L shape rule here and so on and so forth until we come to this final design here. And then you have this other possible derivation where the rules are applied a bit differently and you end up with a very fundamentally different design. The key thing here is that these line segments are not given as individual objects, but, and this is also uh, part of this example, the line segments um, can then be combined to, to uh, new line segments and the matching really can match these lines anywhere in the shape. And so, what what you have is that the rules can be very simple but the result can be very surprising and and very uh interesting and this concept is called emergence of shape you start with some seemingly simple rules and then you obtain a result that you would have never thought about getting if you just think about the rules. And somehow these shape grammars to reformulate it, they can surprise you with the result that you get. Of course, there are many extensions, computer implementation, colors, attributes, and so on. But uh, the key is actually just understandable from the example that I showed. So what you see a lot, again, is this term emergence of shape in a lot of the papers. But the problem here is that an automatic derivation is not really possible. So you can do a manual derivation uh, and then look at uh, a lot of the results. But when I say it's not really possible, the automatic derivation is that you get just way too many designs that are just completely random and it becomes too difficult to specify a design space where the output are largely high quality designs. The other really important thing back then were L systems and L systems were also really influential and really fascinating because this is how the plant modeling, procedural rule-based plant modeling started. I'd like to emphasize this book, The Algorithmic Beauty of Plants from Prusinkiewicz and Lindmeier. And again, we can understand what they do with a simple example. So here are six simple examples generating 2D plants. And these examples are generated with uh, kind of one or or two rules. So we'll pick these three examples here. What we have is basically a string derivation system where you have a starting uh, string F and then in subsequent iterations, each F is being replaced by this following string, F bracket plus F bracket F and so on. And then after deriving for a few iterations, maybe n equals five means five iterations, what we have is a long string and that we, this long string is then interpreted by a logo style turtle. Whenever F is encountered, the turtle moves forward a particular amount. If you look at this plant here, it will move forward, whatever this tiny branch is. And then, these bracket operations, they push and pop the turtle position 
onto a stack so that when one opening bracket is matched with a closing bracket, the state of the turtle is restored at the particular point and orientation in space. So that means that within a bracket, the turtle can build a whole branch. And then after the branch is finished, so if it goes up here, creates all that, then the closing bracket brings the turtle back to here. And there's a parameter. So forward means forward and plus and minus are rotations in clockwise and counterclockwise direction. And back then, uh, the, the big question was, you know, can we do something equally cool for urban models? And the plant modeling was significantly better developed uh, when the urban modeling uh, started to gain more traction. So the rule-based urban modeling, I would say really started in the early 2000s. This is uh, the initial approach for, I would say, for urban modeling. And one, the, the main idea of this uh, initial approach was to kind of look at uh, buildings and streets. And I will just talk about buildings here now. Um, and for buildings, the main idea was to say, OK, we will uh, model architecture, but we focus on the arrangement of shapes, the arrangement of assets. So it's not about how do the individual ornaments look like? How do the individual, individual windows look like? But how are they arranged in space? So the assumption is that there would be an asset library of these textured individual windows and doors and maybe in ornaments, and that uh, we have a system, a rule-based system, that allows us to distribute these elements in space. And uh, for this, I, I'll focus a lot on my own work, uh, which is, which are the basically original fusion of, you know, can we take what something from the shape grammar literature and something from this L system literature, and can we do something similar for uh, buildings? So we have uh, an example here that, that just shows how, how this works. So we have commands that focus on, for a facade, splitting a rectangle into smaller rectangles. And these commands need to be independent of the size of the starting rectangle so that uh, a variety of different designs can be generated. So if you look at this real world facade to the left, then this is the structure uh, that we could abstract. There are a bunch of floors, there's a separate first floor, and then there's a ledge between the first and second floor. What you see here is a rule in this rule-based system below that would take a rectangle labeled facade on the left and split it into three rectangles labeled top floors, ledge, and first floor on the right. The rule here we see is like split Y. This is kind of a command. So there are multiple types of commands or splitting rules. And then there are these size definitions that can either be absolute sizes or, or uh, relative sizes. So in this case, the first floor has the height of 3.5. The ledge is 0.3 high. And then we have something like uh, approximately one is uh, all the top floors. And, and uh, sorry, this, this tilde one means that the rest of the space should be divided into these uh, top floors. And so then basically top floors takes all the space that's not taken by first floor and by ledge. Here's a repeat rule that says, okay, this rectangle top floors, we wanna split into rectangles labeled floor. And each of them should be approximately, if you look at the rule, three meters high. And then 
other rules, you can split floors into tiles, tiles into some more details and more details. And then you get the result that looks as what you see on the right, where uh, a facade is subdivided into a bunch of rectangles. And uh, some of them will be window rectangles, some of them will be wall rectangles. And there's a ledge rectangle still in the first floor rectangle that uh, is not shown here. That you know, rules haven't been applied for this one yet. And there are a lot of extensions. Uh, so there are commands for insertion of assets, uh, rotation, scale, translation, extrusion, uh, splitting into multiple shapes, and uh, there's support for 2D and 3D shapes, maybe different shape attributes, different shape geometries. Um, there were extensions proposed for controlling the execution and order of commands, maybe the conditional rules and uh, the commands of the form, maybe a selection and an action. Um, their questions were how to specify rules interactively or maybe how to generate a graph-based editor for procedural models. Uh, how can we create you know, more powerful scripting languages or domain-specific languages is a related problem that other people looked at in graphics a bit later, or how to generate procedural models on the GPU in uh, real time. So um, not going into all these details, so, so one example results from an earlier paper uh, that, that is in 2006, is inspired by some American suburbs. Um, and then this is kind of the last paper that someone in my group worked on is from uh, TVCG 2019 that can do more complex mass models with a uh, different type of grammar. This work has been used by uh, quite a lot of people, either by re-implementation or, or using the software City Engine. And uh, I don't really have any uh, um, examples how this is used in industry, but if you would look at some of these games, open world games that lead a lot of uh, content, then uh, this type of content is ideally generated with a procedural system such as uh, City Engine to place assets and uh, it's, almost uh, inevitable to come up with a similar set of rules or a very similar set of um, modeling strategies in order to model something like this. And as discussion, I think that this is still the, the these are the best basic results uh, for modeling facades and mass models for generating large urban models. I do not think uh, there has been, uh, or there is a better solution uh, out there yet. And this works reasonably well to generate a small variety of designs. Um, a downside is this type of work re requires technical skills and design skills a combination that is very rare. But nowadays, if you look at this, uh, this type of work is uh, difficult to publish. In some sense, to rewrite history, this is of course not what happened, you could look at this through the lens of domain-specific languages. And uh, domain-specific languages, uh, you saw the rise and fall somehow in popularity. Um, in some sense, if you look at domain-specific languages, you have something other, other opportunities. It's like, why, why not use a domain agnostic, agnostic language like C++ or Python? And then, you know, looking at some also of these very important papers, uh, an extension to the CGA by uh, Michael Schwartz and Pascal Müller, uh, you see that the language becomes more and more powerful. And then people basically ask the question, okay, why, why don't we just use Python or C++ if you add more and more and more of these language elements? 
Um, now, this is really a, a um, very fundamental question, right? If someone would like to go back now and design such a procedural modeling system, would 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 one really want to have a own specific language for this, or are we going to simply write some, take some existing scripting language and, and write some libraries for Python, for example. Now, the other uh, significant problem still is it's difficult to generate a large variety of designs. And the reason is that um, with this large variety of designs, it takes a lot of work to write all the rules and to be able to uh, really invest so much manpower in generating enough variability. So, so the problem is, seems to be that we can maybe generate a few high quality designs, but we cannot nearly generate enough of them as we would like. Or you can write some overly randomized rule, but very, very quickly, maybe you can hit a few more high quality designs, but you will be drowned out and overwhelmed by low quality designs that are not useful. One very interesting topic is inverse procedural modeling. And here I would like to emphasize my favorite uh, paper in some sense, or this because it uses, or I think it was the first to use this concept of Bayesian grammar induction, where you say, okay, we start with a bunch of exemplar designs. And then what we would like to do is we would like to optimize for a grammar that can generate, you know, all these exemplar designs, but as few as possible bad designs. And also we would like to have this grammar to be kind of as short as possible, something going in the direction of minimum description length. Uh, this is a very elegant framework that I found was, was very uh, inspirational for uh, inverse procedural modeling. Now, people also looked at interaction plus procedural models. So here the idea is to, to say, can we either interactively model the rules, people looked at uh, graph-based editors for rules, or if we have a model, can we interactively edit it? So you see maybe a building like this, and then if you take a corner and drag it, then you know, just automatically generate a lot more floors. Again, I mean, this is by way, no way is this representative, it's just giving some idea of what problems people looked at. Um, one fundamental question is if with these procedural models, can we actually use them as priors for urban reconstruction? And there are several papers that attempted that, but most of them have had basically exactly the problem I described before. There are no really good procedural models that uh, have a lot of the good designs or and, and not too many low quality designs that, that would enable them to be like really meaningful priors for a very uh, large set of models. However, and, and I think this is also a very uh, important paper in this area, it's not really using it for reconstruction, but it's using the idea in uh, sketch-based modeling, which is somewhat similar, where instead of trying to match images, you try to match sketches. So here the uh, rules are there to control uh, some, some uh, sketch-based modeling. Now, after this rule-based modeling, there was uh, optimization. Um, and there are two main branches. I would say there's uh, discrete continuous mixed optimization with mass methods such as meta heuristics, simulated annealing, and genetic algorithms. And there is continuous optimi 
optimization such as uh, QP, LP, or some second order methods. Um, so this came a bit after this rule-based modeling. So here are some examples. These are all from you know, collaborators of mine, maybe for a computational lighting design, functional layouts, and street and parcel layouts. Um, but the general problem is, is always that discrete continuous optimization is, is kind of not like super elegant and then continuous optimization is generally not uh, expressive enough. Um, so when you look at this idea, how can we kind of do this optimization in a way so that we can have more variability that it can be expressive enough and uh, still can, can, can kind of generate something that's more similar to you know, a large variety of procedural models. And so I think here also a very influential paper is this, again, it's somewhat a simple concept, but it's basically saying, okay, but what we do is we take a graphical model, uh, this can be any graphical model, so, you know, Bayesian networks are popular. And then later on, uh, factor graphs became uh, quite popular. So we have some um, graphical model to model attributes. And that's then coupled with an optimization algorithm to take these attributes and uh, then generate the final layouts. So in this case, the graphical model generated some attributes about floor plans, and then the optimization filled in the details for these floor plans. So we also did something quite a bit later for uh, complete building mass models. Uh, but I think that the, real, the, the main idea in uh, urban modeling goes back to this paper from Merrill and Colton. Uh, people also looked at simulation. So we have uh, examples of traffic simulation, weather simulation, or crowd simulation for modeling aspects of urban environments. So this type of work uh, is not really something uh, I was involved in. And uh, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Nowadays, of course, um, the question is, how, how can we use uh, deep learning for urban modeling. And so there are multiple competitors, I would say generative adversarial networks or GANs, uh, variational autoencoders, VAEs, and then it's a bit tough to group. So I basically call it transformer, which is, you know, kind of for going along this line out the regressive models, pixel CNN, pixel CNN plus plus, pixel snail. So uh, using the transformers in this way. And maybe to a lesser extent, reinforcement learning, RNNs, uh, I would say uh, the first three are the ones I want to comment on. So traditionally, GANs for image generation work by having something like an inverse classification network. It's a, it's a network that starts with uh, low resolution images with many channels and then progressively up samples to an RGB output image. This is an early architecture, I think from Rushford. And so you start with a vector, maybe a hundred dimensional vector, 512 dimensional vector of random numbers, and then you generate an image as output. The field is uh, kind of dominated from one particular group or maybe one particular person even, uh, Tero Karas, who really did fantastic work in the area of generative adversarial networks. And uh, so the state of the art networks are uh, basically iterations of the StyleGen architecture where uh, StyleGen 2 ADA is, is out there. I don't actually know if the code right now for StyleGen 3 is out there yet. Uh, so, so these examples are from StyleGen 2 uh, for face images. And these face images look really, really fantastic. Uh, this looks like really realistic. And not only do the images 
look great, began in an unsupervised fashion, learns an extremely great latent space. So just some random work from, from our group, not connected to urban modeling. But if you, if you think about this, that the, the, the GAN can not only generate uh, a face, but it can generate many different variations of the person. So it seems like almost it understands the three-dimensional structure. You can change the lighting, you can change the hair. Uh, it, it, it's really a absolutely amazing uh, achievement. The question is, can we actually do something like this? Can we use the GAN to learn a parametric representation or can we use the GAN to learn layouts as images? And here, I think the success is a lot less because the GAN, if you try to learn these discrete structures as images, and you use the image-based GANs that, that have these fantastic results on faces and similar, uh, you, you get these blobs. It doesn't really understand that the rooms are supposed to be rectangles. What you see is the boundaries is kind of blobby. It, it looks like, oh, it kind of looks maybe like a floor plan, but uh, these are the general type of results that people get. Now there is some work, of course, how can we get this to work? And uh, I think one very interesting idea is that has been used multiple times and also in the area of uh, urban modeling to say, okay, we have a GAN and a differentiable renderer. So, so the idea is that the GAN doesn't judge the discrete structure itself, the compressed discrete structure, but the GAN kind of judges uh, differentially rendered version. So, so there's some generator, maybe for this uh, roof can that's generating uh, building masses with a roof. So you generate some sort of a discrete compressed representation and then the differentiable vectorization generates the image and then the image you give to the GAN and then the GAN is happier, it's in its domain. Now this is not using this idea here, it's from, from the same group. But it's also, it's kind of again, plus uh, a lot of extra stuff to uh, get some results. I would say another competitor is VAEs. Um, again, just two random examples. And so if you look at VAEs, they don't naturally do well with uh, these discrete structures, such as furniture or let's say building mass models or facades. What you get is, uh, again, more like a system of multiple VAEs where one VAE try to, tries to do the components, another VAE tries to do the structure, but it's also not a straightforward VAE. It's a, like a hierarchically structured VAE. Uh, it gets actually quite complicated to make it work. And then I think most uh, important also is, uh, you know, this, this question of VQ VAE versus traditional VAEs. Again, one of or these two, for me, very influential papers were VQ VAE2 and uh, Taming Transformers. Um, and so if you look at Taming Transformers, these images from Taming Transformers, um, first of all, you notice that uh, the whole thing actually takes a VAE, this is this thing down here. Then it does a GAN, which is this thing up here. And there's an autoregressive kind of transformer up here. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of hard to say, is this, is this now a transformer? Is it a VAE? But um, the, the key idea here of these VQ VAEs was to have a, encoder and a decoder. So let's say we have this image here of the dog that gets encoded into this tensor and then it gets decoded back to the dog. But the real cool thing here in the middle was this quantization step. So they somehow managed that to get these uh, continuous values to be quantized and massively compressed. And still you're kind of able to reconstruct well 
And then this representation is so small, it's like so much smaller than this representation here through the quantization that um, this now becomes much easier to model with a generative model such as a transform. And so I would say this, the VIEs or autoencoder in general, it's, they're, they're really good in the sense because they're really simple in the original form. And especially for smooth continuous representations, but they get really messy and hard to use for discrete structures that we need in urban models. Um, then transformer, again, this may be coming from this direction. This is some earlier work using RNNs using uh, at ICCB for street graph generation. Um, and then this other paper here, I would say is uh, very important polygen that is able to generate meshes. And it's just very important for the generation of discrete structures. It's, it's like an early example of really great results where objects like these two can be generated by first generating all the vertices and then generating all the edges. And uh, the quality is really nice and the complexity is actually very high for a generative model working with discrete structures. And then along this line, so this is just a recent example from our group, uh, you could also do some uh, floor plan modeling, for example. And uh, the idea is, again, you have maybe multiple transformers that work together to generate some uh, discrete elements. And in our particular case, what we did is uh, we, we had transformers generating constraints and then we had some optimization uh, to generate the final layout. But uh, mainly what I want to emphasize here is that based on these three GAN, VAEs and uh, transformer, I am strongly betting on transformer and, and I would strongly discourage people from using VAEs. So that's, that's just my uh, current view and my current experience with, the, with these three. And GANs are, uh, seem to work a bit better, but it still is very hard to get to work for uh, discrete structures. So I think the, the, the actually transformers are much better than uh, the other two at the moment in, in, the terms of, in terms of results. What can you get for a lot of these urban modeling problems? All right, this concludes my talk, thanks. And uh, I acknowledge all my co-authors that uh, are a lot of co-authors by now. Uh, DBLP says 224. Um, so uh, yeah, I of course have to uh, thank a lot of people for all this work. Uh, and uh, a lot of the work I introduced were was work by other people anyways. But um, I'll, I guess I'll leave it at that. And uh, I don't know if there are any questions. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Peter for, for the wonderful talk. Uh, now we enter a, a short panel session. So we have a uh, one panelist, uh, Liang Liang, who, who uh, collaborated a lot with, uh, with Peter. Um, so um, I will start one question then. Uh, so, um, uh, oh, oh, right, so I think urban modeling is very important. Uh, so Peter, you did not mention the, the, the uh, the application in autonomous driving, which is a very hot topic now. What is your thoughts? Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, so so I think that um, the, 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 there are multiple directions to go, right? So the first question is urban reconstruction, just plain traditional urban reconstruction for for uh, autonomous driving. And in, in this sense, the, there is some other work to discuss 
to really go that route. It's not like that strongly related to, to, the, to the talk uh, that I gave mm -hmm. here. The other question is, can we generate virtual environments yes. that yes. are useful for, uh, for, for uh, training self-driving cars? Right? And so this goes back to, and this is the fundamental problem of um, a lot of this procedural work that, uh, to find the slide, that we, if you look at this, uh, you know, solutions now, the number of designs that can be generated is too low. And which is something I would like to do, but uh, I, I don't really know a good way to do it. What would need to happen is one would need to generate a lot more rules and really be able to generate uh, hundred thousands or millions of, of useful designs that are more representative of what you see in the real world and then test if and how much, how far can, can these procedural models be used uh, for training other machine learning models. And this is something that uh, I wanted to do for many years, but uh, didn't really achieve that. But I'm not aware of anybody else that uh, was able to do it either. But I think that's the, that's the obvious thing that should be done. OK. OK, thanks. So Leonel, do you have a question? Yes, yes, I have uh, many questions. Uh, hi, Peter. It's nice to be at hey. your presentation again. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can start with a very short question. Um, your talk was mainly about modeling new environments, but I do know, we don't know you also have done great work in reconstruction. Uh, so why is that, why that is not covered in this talk? Uh, this is just time. Uh, this, this talk is already, um, this talk is already a bit uh, too, too many topics, uh, I felt. And um, the, the talk is more more coherent that way, but but I do uh, I do agree that uh, so. And the other thing is for urban reconstruction is very hard to give an overview talk. Maybe then there's uh, even ten times more work or fifty times more work than in uh, this work for for actually synthesis. Okay, so you choose an easier one. <laughs> Well, like more doable, maybe not easier, more, more manageable. Okay, uh, yeah, through your talk, we see uh, you give a very good overview uh, uh, of the techniques used in modeling virtual environment. We have seen remarkable uh, progress in modeling or, uh, virtual environment, especially with, uh, in the past few years with deep learning, with GAN, uh, these great techniques but we don't see much progress in reconstructing uh, the urban environment. So what do you think the, what, what, what do you think are the reasons that these techniques are less effective or maybe something are lacking uh, in, in for, for reconstruction? Um, that's a very good, uh, that's a very good question. So if I work on, and we have, you know, multiple topics, uh, that are related, then unfortunately the the main problem to start is can you get some training data? And it's very difficult to get the training data and the effort for generating training data is is just very high. Yeah. So for example, we worked on with with one of my students that graduated in the summer, Ching Ren, we worked on uh, we worked on roof modeling, and just to get a few thousand roofs, it's also very expensive and time consuming. You need to get a company involved. You need to set up the contracts. You need to pay a lot of money for labeling, and then at the end, the data set is still kind of smaller by order of magnitude than, than what you would like. And I think uh, 
issues with with this reconstruction are that uh, good data sets are missing uh, to to really uh, create this big leap in uh, reconstruction. Okay, so you mean the the the, the main challenge, the, the biggest obstacle here is the uh, the lack lack of a uh, uh, sufficiently large data set for training. But let's assume you already have a a, a very big uh, data set for the urban environment. I, I don't think that can solve all the problems. Um, are there any are something else that something other things that need to be addressed for applying deep learning techniques on uh, reconstruction? Well, um, I think once the once the big data set is there, then we will see what uh, then we will see what uh, what the actual problems are. Um, but so. I mean, I could make some random speculations, but uh, I know for us in 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 our group, that has been that has that the 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 kind of lack of data to gain more experience is a significant is a significant obstacle. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, that's why in our group we also uh, we recently released a, a data set for semantic urban uh, understandings, uh, semantic segmentation. So it has, mm -hmm. has uh, 16 uh, square kilometers uh, of uh, urban environment, but it uh, contains only mesh models. Uh, yeah, maybe you can use it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, that, uh, that sounds interesting. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, please okay. go ahead. But and and the other thing, of course, is that in the in the in the ideally, you don't want to be problem specific uh, if you don't have to. So so ideally, uh, urban reconstruction can be solved with a general technique that works to reconstruct uh, everything, right? The, the, yeah. The, and of course, there's a lot of relationship uh, between just doing urban reconstruction and just reconstructing whatever any any type of object that that uh, you would like to have yeah uh yeah you you in your talk you also you mentioned uh, inverse procedure modeling you have done a lot of work in procedure modeling i think these are great tools for uh, modeling and designing uh yeah you but you might mention that for reconstruction uh, so what is missing for these techniques to be used for reconstruction? So what, what can we do to bridge the gap between uh, uh, modeling a new environment and reconstructing existing environments? Right, so I think if you, if you look at the, the one approach, then the approach would be to use a you know, rule-based system or, or some simple model to be used as a prior for reconstruction. And mm. this would work if you have a very narrow set of designs where you can write the rules for. So an example are the data sets that deal with uh, Paris buildings because there was this guy Hausmann in Paris that was like super strict and told everybody exactly how their facades have to look like. So, so then this is feasible to model because people couldn't build arbitrary facades. And then if you have exactly these house many and facades, you can actually almost write the grammar for them or rules for them that span the space of possible designs and then use that uh, as a prior for reconstruction. So, but if you go, to any arbitrary city, uh, it's difficult to, or people haven't managed to, to, to write like the rules that would be powerful enough to handle arbitrary cities. Now, the other direction is the question of, can we learn procedural models from uh, input models? So, so do you just, Maybe you construct a bunch of, uh, let's even say mass models, or you reconstruct a bunch of facades, and then you say, okay, learn a grammar for me, or learn a rule-based model for me. And there's some initial work, 
but again, it's it's missing the amount of data to become really significant. So, so there are a few techniques that one could try and, and people had some very nice initial ideas, but the data is missing to judge if this work can be significant or, or not. Hmm. Okay, so, Peter, so I have inserted one question from, the, from YouTube. So nice talk, Peter, you mentioned the controllability of the gener gener generation rules are really hard. Can you shed some light on the possible solution, like how to combine the interaction with the learning rules? This is for Alex Khan. So, so I think some of the some of the work that that we looked at that would be an easy interface is if the, there's you can do a model where you have high level input, you say, okay, I like the model or not. It's more, you say, okay, maybe I like this part. I don't like this part and give me something new. Just maybe keep these parts, but but do this. And, and there, there's some, some work in that direction that, that could be used. Um, and then the, the, other, the other part is, almost setting up constraints by the user. So, so you, people looked at systems, in, you know, including people from our group where, um, yeah, the, the, the user says, okay, give me something with small windows and five floors and, and then a, a, a model generates what you want or this one particular work from uh, Ariaga's group where, there's a sketch and then the, the sketch kind of tells you which, which of the rules to select. Um, and so I think these, again, there, there are nice methods uh, out there and there are some very good initial results. But uh, again, the question is, does it really scale? Can, can this work for like a very large rule base? So this, this I would say is uh, the open question. Okay, thanks. Next, uh, uh, for the final question, Liang Liang, do we have uh, further questions? Yeah, maybe I can ask the last question. Uh, so yeah, with the develop development of AI, especially uh, deep learning techniques, many things that were not possible before uh, now have uh, become possible. Uh, we see many, many papers trying to answer traditional research questions using deep learning. So from your point of view, uh, what could be the opportunities in using or developing deep learning techniques for modeling or uh, and reconstruct uh, reconstructing urban environments? Well, I think that that basically uh, right now there are there are still um, many opportunities. Basically, I would see the going in this line of work. Uh, you just need to be very familiar with. The generative models, as I said, uh, the best bet is you become an expert in transformers, because that I think is uh, significant uh, in 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 what it can do, and then you can go and look at each of these individual components of an urban environment. You can say, okay, can I model furniture layouts? Can I model uh, streets? Can I model um, facades, can I model mass models? And, uh, but the problem of course is you need, a, you need a technical contribution and you need the data set uh, to, to actually make it a complete project. But if you look at uh, some of the examples I, sh I showed, so you saw this uh, from Furukawa's group, uh, like house scan, roof scan, you know, these are papers from uh, at, at uh, CVPR that pretty much do exactly that. They just pick one of the topics or this, our floor plan paper from ICCV this year, or this paper from NeurIPS about sketch graphs. So people just say, okay, do we have some data, any particular sub problem and then uh, start working on it. I think there's still a lot of open space uh, that, that these papers uh, can make a good impact. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Niang Niang, for joining the panel session. Thanks, Peter, for all the answers again for the great talk.
And now let's, uh, uh, this is the end of the, this week's 3D GV seminar. Uh, thanks for your attention. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.